during the year. So in other words, so you might even chop off a little bit more extra for the fact that it happens to be the first, well, the first quarter of the year is not the summer, but whatever the first quarter of the year, let's say for that particular business, is traditionally and historically very, very much below the average throughout the rest of the year. So basically, our job is to figure out what impact does the cycle have, what impact does the season have. Now, the I can't be figured out. By definition, it's totally unpredictable. The I is like what? What, do we, what symbol do we have for the I in other chapters? This, you got to answer quickly because we only have 20 minutes to cover an important topic. What, what symbol do we have for the I in other chapters? And the answer, to give myself a point, is the epsilon. The epsilon was like the amount that's totally, you know, pr uh, the deviation from the straight line was totally unpredictable. And also, but it was, that was in chapter 13 and 14. What about in chapter 11? What symbol do we have for the error in chapter 11? And the answer is, to give myself another point, the sigma squared. The amount of, remember, people are different, just totally, people are just randomly different. That sigma squared of experimental error, for those of you who might still remember this, the, the sigma squared of experiment. So every chapter really has built into it in statistics a recognition that there's going to be a certain amount of randomness that has to be taken into account mathematically. Now, I told you that the, the, our job is to calculate these four things. Now, this thing you can't calculate. We'll deal with it by averaging things out so that the, the pluses and minuses will cancel out. The T we're going to calculate by, by the B0 and the B1. We'll do that in a couple of minutes. The C we're going to deal with by simply saying, let's make believe there's no cycle. In other words, let's make believe this particular data is the first, is, is, there's no cycle here. It's just, just a straight line and a season. Why? Because just mathematically, I want to show you the thing quickly. And once you do this on a real life on a computer program, you would tell the computer to take into account all three of them. But for our purposes right now, we're simply going to eliminate the possibility that the data has a cycle. And finally, how do you calculate the season? Well, the season by itself is not a single number. Basically, it's going to be four separate numbers called S1, S2, S3 and S4. It's basically what impact does being in the first quarter of the year have on your data? And the answer is say, traditionally, in the first quarter of the year, the, the data is down by 5%. Traditionally, during the second quarter of the year, the data is pretty much the same as the average throughout the year. S3 may be up by 5%. S4 might be, you know, flat. The point is each one of these might be a separate little number indicating that if you know you're in the first quarter, this is now the first quarter of the year, so you would, you would impact this particular forecast by the amount that the S1 tells you you're supposed to make the adjustment by. Now, if this sounds complicated, it's not. In reality, it's really a bunch of uh, straightforward, simple multiplying and dividing steps that we're going to implement right now. Um, Okay, so 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 the first step is to cast. The first step is to show you some data. So what we got to do right now is fill in the following chart. So the next ten minutes we're going to fill in the following chart, and hopefully the next five minutes, the last five minutes will make the actual forecast. But again, ninety percent of the chart is simply calculating the B zero and the B one, which everybody hopefully knows how to do already. Um, um, bum, 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 bum. Okay, so here's the data. So we're going to you're given the data in the following format. You're given the Y data. You're told what year it's in. You're told what quarter it's in. And let me just give you some real life data. It stands for is not relevant because I'm only using part of the data. But let's say it stands for the, you know, the amount of uh, building private residential construction. OK. So it says 19, uh, 2008. We started this in 1990, well, 1988, okay, 2008, 2009, but again, 2009, well, 2008. Now, quarter one had a value of 10.2. Quarter two had a value of 12.4. Quarter three had a value of 14.8. And quarter four for that year had a value of 15.0. That's one year. You, you can't make predictions based on one year. You need like five to 10 of 20 years. But we're going to do it for two years. 2009, the uh, first quarter was 11.2. Quarter two was 14.3. Quarter three was 18.4. And quarter four was 18.0. And again, you really can't uh, do this uh, 
practically it's such a small amount of data, but we'll try to see what we get. Okay. Now, can somebody suggest what I'm going to ask you to do next? What? You said plot it? Yeah, it was always good. If I can teach you one thing in life, plot the data, you're going to be way ahead of the game. So let's plot it quickly. Now, we can take 19, uh, 2009, quarter one, two, three, four. This is the y value. It goes somewhere between 10 and 18. So we've got to go 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. What did you say? 2008, thank you, 2008. And this 10.2, do it quickly, because again, we only have a few minutes, 12.4, 14.8, 15.0. Then we're going to go 11.2, then we'll be 2009, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2009. Uh, 2009, we 11.2. Then 14.3. Then 18.4 and 18.0. Now, would you connect it like this, or would you connect it by a straight line? The answer is at this point. Well, if the data had a nice path, if the data follow one of the patterns I'm trying to teach you, I would, I would connect it like that. But really, we just want to create basically the straight line through the data, and the, the straight line was something like this. Okay, so this, so again, I, I wouldn't argue that there's a clear pattern here because there's only eight dots and the numbers are pretty variable. But what the data is supposed to show us, what this formula works great when the data has again pretty much a straight line data, with some meandering up and down according to the quarters of the year. And if there's cyclical data, then of course you'd have to do a slightly different approach, but it would be very similar to what we're doing here. Next, so the basic approach to this problem is we're going to calculate the t, and we're going to try to get, let me just tell you the, the, sort of what we were going with this. We're going we're to calculate the trend. We're going to say, what where, where will be the prediction for each point? What's the prediction here, the prediction here, the prediction here, the prediction here? We're going to make a prediction for each one of these values by the same method we used in chapter 13 many times over. Then we're going to figure out how far apart is the prediction from the actual. Now, how, when you, the, the difference between the prediction and the actual is, can be explained by what? The amount that the, the data deviates, the, the straight line deviates from the actual data can be explained by what? Well, the, the, the three factors that influence the data are the trend, the season, and the irregular. So the fact that the, anything that deviates from the trend has to be attributed to the season and the irregular. So, so we're trying to isolate, the, remember our goal is to isolate the season. That's our goal of this whole thing. So then we can make adjustments to get the best kind of, kind of forecast. So we're going to calculate the t by, by the method of chapter 13. And then we're going to calculate y divided by t is how much? Well, this we got rid of already. It's the s and the i. But we really want to focus on the s. How do you get rid of the i? The answer is, again, you'll see this in a couple of minutes. We're going to average everything by averaging the i, which is sometimes above the line, sometimes below. It's totally random. By averaging stuff, you're going to get rid of the i. You're left with a pure measure of s. And then we can basically make an adjustment. So that's just that's the, the, the sort of the, the the game plan for this whole thing. So where are we up to? So now the so the next step is to figure out the B0 and the B1 that's going to be useful for calculating the trend. And then we can then once we get that number, we'll divide it into the y to continue this the next couple of steps. Now, what is the B0 in this case? Can somebody make a quick uh, uh, guess at what the B0 is going to be? What? It's going to be around 10. It seems to be going, so, so in fact, the B0 when we do the, should come out to around 10. What's the slope going to be? Can you make a guess there? Well, let's see. You went from, from, from 1 to 8. Uh, we went eight you know, the x changed by 8 points. And how much did the y change for during that period of time? Well, we went from about 10 to 18, roughly from 10 to 18, give or take a little bit. So it went from about 8, and it went around 7 or 8 over here. So what's going to be the slope? Probably pretty close to 1, all right? So the slope, let me, before, I, before I make a fool of myself, let me make sure that's the answer. The answer I know for the B0 definitely is 10. Very next thing to do, if you want to tell me before I jump in and, and grab the point. What's the, what's the very next? We want to figure out the B0 and the B1. What's the very next thing you got to do? Yes? What? No, no, we can't interpret anything until after. We're not going to get into, there's very little verbal questions in this chapter, at least online, in class. In chapter 13 and 14, that was part of the test, the very next interpret. But first, before you interpret something, you've got to calculate it. So what's the next thing you've got to do to calculate the B0 and the B1? Before we plug it into the formula, is what? What? 
There's no 